Well, we're, we're having more fun even before the event starts. But everybody, aloha. aloha. So glad to see you. I'm Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and I'm just delighted to see everybody here at Wallet Hub. No, <laughs> Impact Hub, actually. But it's great to see you. You know, we, we gather every now and then for some conversations, and we're going to have a great conversation tonight with a couple of luminaries in the business journalism world. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Grassroot Institute. We are your independent think tank here in Hawaii, working on issues of the economy, government, and uh, transparency, building a better society. And our aim is to be independent, a voice that is neither right nor left, but is based upon issues. And I'm so glad you're all here with us tonight. You know, we're going to talk a bit tonight about how to improve Hawaii's business climate. And that's a subject that my two guests are very familiar with because they publish on them all the time. To my far left, not politically, but uh, sitting in <laughs> oh, 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 over there. Actually, from your perspective, he's at the far right. And perspective is everything with him. Cam Napier is the editor-in-chief of Pacific Business News. Uh, he was with Honolulu Magazine for 19 years. He started as an associate editor there, served as managing editor, he got promoted to editor, and he held that post for eight years. Then um, as editor-in-chief, Cam oversees all the newsroom operations and content for Pacific Business News, including the weekly print edition and the website. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's completed executive training at Southern Methodist University Cox School of Business. And he's one of the most interesting voices in business journalism in the state of Hawaii with some very poignant remarks that you need to read on a weekly basis. Please give a big hand to Cam Napier. You can say hello, Cam, if you'd like. Thanks for coming, everybody. Now I'm totally nervous. <laughs> Next to Cam, in the middle, is Steve Petranik. He's the editor of Hawaii Business Magazine. Now, before joining the magazine in 2009, he spent 18 years as an editor in the Honolulu Star Bulletin. Back then, it was called the Star Bulletin, for those of you who are millennials here today. And he spent five years at the Honolulu Advertiser. He's reported from six countries and three continents, and his stories have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times. Under Petranik's leadership, Hawaii Business Magazine has focused on major issues dealing with the economy, Hawaii's people, housing, cost of living, education, leadership and innovation, diversifying the local economy, and disruption caused by technology as well as the environment. Everything is in there, including the kitchen sink. And again, one of the great voices in business journalism. Please give a hand to Steve Petranik. Thank you. Thank you. you want to say a couple of words? Uh, delighted to be here and glad to see a diverse audience, young people and uh, more established people. So thank you for the invitation. <laughs> I think that was somewhat slightly under politically correct, but it was, <laughs> it was acceptable here today. Well, I didn't want to say older people. I wanted to so, <laughs> People who have um, earned their stripes, let's say. You know, one of the questions some of you may be wondering is why these gentlemen are in the field of business journalism. Why not just do business and make money and be quiet and live, in a, live a peaceful life? But uh, Cam, why did you go into business journalism? Well, I didn't want to be ruined by success, so <laughs> I, I chose writing for a, for a living. Uh, no, ever since I was a child, uh, writing is just what I do, and uh, I feel very lucky in a, in a small town like this to have been able to make a career doing that, and uh, even though Honolulu Magazine was a general interest publication, uh, some of my favorite articles have always had a business component. I'm fascinated by people and their work, what they do. Anyone remember the Richard Scarry children's book, What Do People Do All Day? That's one of my favorites. Every time I meet somebody in a line of work I don't know anything about, I, I want to tour the business, you know? What does it look like there? So when you were four years old, you just imagined you'd grow up and be a business journalist and Exactly, publisher. exactly. <laughs> no, it just, as, as my career evolved, it just felt like a very natural fit, and fortunately, PBN agreed and brought me on, and 
Here I am. Well, you do very good work. Thank you. Steve, how about you? What drew you into the field of business journalism? Uh, well, I'd, I'd rather write about bankruptcy than actually experience <laughs> it. So I think that was a smart career move on my uh, I grew out of um, you know general news reporting and general news editing. But this is a great opportunity to work for Dwayne Carizu and have a business magazine. And business is central to everything we do in, in Hawaii. So it's a great platform. I don't, uh, I don't necessarily see myself just as a narrow business magazine. We write a, a business affects everything. All those topics you mentioned, from housing to uh, you know, supporting the community, where people live, how they live their lives. Business is all connected to that. Well, what you do is very important because you help raise the level of discourse about what makes Hawaii work. Without your commentary on business, we'd all be thinking it's just about government, perhaps. Well, we, you know, I, when I describe uh, journalism, we are a necessary condition to change. We're not a sufficient condition to change. We, I can put something on the cover of the magazine and things aren't going to change. But if we start talking about those things, that can lead to change. So that's, that's how I see my role, that necessary condition of helping continue a conversation, generate a conversation. Well, very good. Before we go into questions, just a couple of announcements. First, we definitely want you to be involved in asking questions tonight. So jot some down, think about that. And then when the time comes, because we're sending this out broadcasting to the world, we want you to come up here to my right to this microphone and ask your question. And I'm a really mean guy, I hope you can tell. If you, if you do something other than ask a question, I'm gonna cut you off. For example, if you come up and say, I really don't have a question, but I wanna, <laughs> I wanna say what such and such, our big thugs will come up to you and escort you out of the building. Oh. But keep that in mind, this is for you. We really want you to ask your questions and whatever you feel is pertinent is very, very welcome. So come on up at the time we open it up. Also, I'm delighted that one of the board of directors, members of the Grassroot Institute is here today, Mark Bonascalco. Mark, you want to wave? Finally, you'll get a survey card. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. We need to know how we're doing. We want you to jot some comments down, tell us how you like this, everything from the air conditioning to finding the place or whatever you liked about the content. And don't forget, unless you want to pay parking, uh, if you've got a parking ticket, stop by the front desk over here on your way out to get it validated. You've all seen surveys ranking Hawaii as a business entity or business climate. We're usually down in the bottom of the list. Wallet Hub, for example, recently published a survey ranking us as number 47, the 47th worst state in the nation in which to start a business. CNBC just recently ranked us a little higher than that, 29th in terms of having a business climate. And we could go on and on. I know these two gentlemen are very familiar with these surveys. Some of them are scientific. Others are just more qualitative and uh, subjective. But are we being beat up unfairly with all of these surveys? Or is there some germ of truth to this? What are your thoughts about this, Steve? Um there's absolute truth in it. Um, you, uh, what I, before this session, I dove into the methodology of a lot of these surveys. And you look at what they're looking at, and um, is it's uh, cost of labor. That's a huge factor, very high here. Uh, tax environment. We don't do too badly on corporate tax, property tax, sales tax. We do horribly on income tax, and that's where most you know, with flow through uh, structures for businesses, that's where you get hit. It's on the income tax. We're 47th in the nation, according to the National Tax Foundation, on income taxes. So that's, that's a hard, it's hard to keep a business going if your profits get taxed at a high level. Regulation, that's a huge part of it. I don't know that. That's what our readers tell us. That's what businesses tell us. That's what they tell the legislature. That, those are huge factors. Um, you go down the list, um, if, if it's not just the cost of labor, how much labor is available? Well, we have a 2% unemployment rate. If you want to grow your business, it's really hard to find people. That's a huge factor. And then infrastructure is a big problem. We already have a, um, a liability in that we're islands separated by an ocean. That's a, that's a challenge for, we can't drive 
to Maui. We can't drive the big island. And when the super ferry shuts down, that just leaves one less option for infrastructure. So for all those reasons and many more, those, those are very valid studies of why it's hard to do business. Let me go over to Cam and ask, yeah. are you in general agreement with what Steve has said about oh, the validity of these surveys? Yeah, we, we report on them too. And I do, like Steve, you know, we, we get deluged with these all the time in media, right? The content uh, uh, producers send things out all the time and they, wanna, they want you to write about them because they've measured where Honolulu is, where Hawaii is. And we take a look at who did the measuring and what their sources were. And, and whether or not they know what they're talking about. For example, one tried to sell me on how awesome the tax picture in Hawaii was because the property taxes were so low. And I, I replied to them, like, the reason you're seeing this anomaly is we're the only state in America that doesn't pay for schools through property taxes, which they had no idea. So uh, gave them that feedback. But you know, one thing that's interesting about all of these surveys, so they're, they're up on the mainland and they're looking at data that they can find. Uh, the, the things I think a lot of us worry about most are, are very intangible things about the business climate that don't show up in these surveys, and they're the things I hear from businesses a lot, uh, including the most disturbing thing is, is the level of fear that's out there on the part of business owners and executives uh, when it comes to feeling safe about criticizing the way things are run in Hawaii. Now let me clarify, so, just so that our audience gets what you're saying. You're not saying well, so, you're not saying businesses are afraid because of a competitive market. You're not saying they're afraid to get out there right. against the competition. You're saying they're fr afraid. Some, of, sometimes of, that, of, but, of, but they're afraid no, of Big they're, Brother. They're afraid of the government. Yeah, they're they're afraid if they criticize a tax policy, if they uh, if they stand up for TMT, whatever the issue is, that somehow they will not get a permit that they need or they'll be uh, audited, or they'll get a surprise inspection, or they won't get business. You know, it's, it's such an isolated market, and, and everyone knows everybody, right? And uh, you, you need to feel like you could always at any time do business with people. And, and so business leaders in Hawaii, I think, are, are especially prone to just keeping quiet when there's things they would otherwise like to say out loud because they're afraid of repercussions. Now, no, no survey from WalletHub is going to know that or quantify it or measure it. Now, that's very interesting. And although it's anecdotal, and I'll ask Steve about that if he hears the same stories in a moment, uh, what I'm hearing as the underbelly of what you're saying is that government has its hands in the business climate. It either is the provider of the permit the, the rules, the regulations it sets, or it is actually the provider of the work being right. the one to provide the contracts. And if you don't speak with a certain amount of silence, in other words, if you speak out too loudly or you criticize government, you're saying that that could have negative repercussions on your ability to do business. They, they feel that it could. Oh, the feeling there. That, Which is, this is very different from a reality. So we're talking but, about perception here. Uh, you know, it's like the legend of Kaiser Soze, right? If you know the film The Usual yeah. Suspects. Like, if you have the legend of Kaiser Soze, you don't actually have to be mean to anybody because people will just think that you will be and they'll fall in line. So I, I don't know, you know, how, how much the fear is overblown. Well, let's bring Steve It's, it's impossible to measure that. People, right. um, but if uh, we, we depend on people talking on the record. We don't, we don't use anonymous sources except right. in ex extraordinary circumstances. And if people are reluctant to, to talk on the record, you know, our stories are less rich. So people are, are, are there is a fear of that. I, we were shocked once when we did one of our many stories on building permits. <laughs> it's a recurring issue, so we keep reporting on it. We take it a different angle each time, you know, and focus in on something. But a fellow whose restaurant, and um, I can name it because it's still operating, Square Barrels, he actually, he hadn't got his permit yet, and he started operating. And we were kind of shocked, and he, yeah, he was willing to talk on the record, so go ahead, we're gonna print it. But he, he had waited so long, and he was not going to be able to keep this business going if he didn't just go ahead and, and open. But that's, that's, that's the sort of thing people are dealing with all the time, and w that we encounter. Uh, in well, our well Steve, yeah. you, you mentioned building permits here, and 
we can understand the fear that could be involved if somebody doesn't do the right things to placate government or is competing against people who are friends of government inspectors and providers of permits. What, what do you think the real underlying problem is? Is it government corruption or government inefficiency or both? Well, I think part of it is uh, there's a degree of capriciousness um, and it's hard to, that's another thing that's impossible to measure. How much of it is, but when the rules are not precise, when they allow a lot of leeway, there is the possibility of capriciousness. Uh, you know that word, people can choose to say yes or no. And um, again, impossible measure, Wallet Hub can't figure it out. Right, and I, I hear that all the time. When I was preparing to, uh, for this panel, I put a, I put a call out to my readers to share your stories. I said, you guys always tell me you're overtaxed and overregulated, but could you be a little more specific? And I got three or four responses, and all but one said, please do not use my name. It's just a friendly panel discussion with a, with a friendly audience. No, don't, don't use my name. Uh, the, the one that did uh, give me permission is, uh, uh, and I'm trying to find his name right now as I speak. But, uh, <laughs> is he retired? Bob, no, no, he still owns his business. Bob Freeman, his business is Mr. Sandman. They do a sandblasting business. Been in business for 40 years with no complaints. And there was a... Uh, oh, that Bob is, is he here. here. There he is. He's All right. right over there. You, okay. <laughs> 47 years. No complaints, right? And uh, he'll give you more details. Out. I'm glad you, you could make it. Um, and then suddenly there was a DLIR inspection that, that ended up in uh, kind of capricious fines. One was $4,000, right, for uh, not having a, one of those blank uh, fill-in-the-gap plastic pieces in a circuit breaker. And it wasn't like they're doing with the restaurants where they come and, and find all the stuff and then give you a chance to fix it. It was like, no, $4,000. And there was an even bigger fine over uh, hearing protection, and they didn't measure inside the, the heavy hood that his employee wears, they put the microphone on the outside of the guy. And so it's measuring the raw sound of the sandblasting. And then uh, the inspector fell asleep during that, right? <laughs> so, you know, and, and that, so that sort of thing goes on. Uh, there, there was another person who told me about how uh, they had to get a particular kind of septic tank that cost 300% more to contain the sewage where they are when he says wild pigs, turkeys, sheep, and goats, not to mention horses at the stables 300 feet from the well, have been defecating on this area for many decades for free of charge. So he's like, where's the logic of this requirement on me that I, I can't use this more affordable option when there's a farm <laughs> full of animals right next to me? So that's the sort of thing that, that feels capricious. Well, let, let's move a little bit now from the psychology to the macroeconomics of what really determines our business climate. What would you say the factors are that actually determine what the business climate is? What are some of the more important ones, Steve? Uh, the education of your workforce, the availability of your workforce, the cost of your workforce. I mean, workforce is huge, and all those factors are big. Um, Infrastructure is big, regulatory environment, taxes, those are all um, aspects of a business climate. Um, availability of capital. So, you know, uh, I don't know if any of you have operated businesses in California, but it has a, you know, high regulation and everything. But one of the things that puts California higher up on, on these ratings is availability of capital, which is something you don't have here. I think they ranked ninth on that Wallet Hub study of where to start a business. And one of the key factors was availability of capital. So in addition to all the problems that, that, you, know, that you have, there's a shortage of enterprise, enterprise capital, venture capital here in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, a, a huge macroeconomic factors are just the sheer amount of money that comes into the islands through government spending, through the federal government with the military presence. 
uh, and tourism itself, right? So absent those two outside forces, if we had to sustain ourselves with an isolated economy of 1.3 or 4 million people, 2,000 miles from anything, I don't know what we would all do for a living. I, like most of us would probably have to move somewhere. Uh, and, and I do think that that, that macroeconomic phenomena, the sheer amount of outside money, kind of, papers over inefficiencies, whether it's, it's within the business community itself or within the way the business community is regulated and constrained. A, a lot of the attitude of, of officialdom in Hawaii towards business is usually influenced by the experience of the, of the plantations as, and the big five. Uh, and then in the post-war era by the sudden explosive growth of, of tourism. And, and it's almost like every single day we're trying to keep Waikiki from happening again. And, and every business in Hawaii kind of pays for that resistance to letting things change and letting things grow. I just wandered really far from the question. Sorry. But, you know, we can <laughs> reel you back in a little bit here and take a look at two, the two factors you mentioned as impacting us greatly, being the, the tourism industry and government spending, which are huge. And Steve was mentioning that there's a lack of capital coming in. But there's obviously capital coming in from the outside in government and in tourism. The question is this. If, if what you're su suggesting is right, that, that these are inordinately too big for Hawaii to sustain our business climate, why haven't we diversified? If there's one topic I've heard at the legislature the, over and over again over the last couple of decades, is we've got to build a diversified economy. What's preventing that from happening? You want to start with that one? I, I, I can go on for days on that. Go ahead, Steve. Um, well, I think, I mean, okay, let's flip the question a bit and talk where does it happen? So uh, I'm going to boast a bit. My daughter just got hired by Facebook. She's straight out of college. She doesn't even graduate to May. She's going to make more money than I do. And I've been in the business 40. Did and you she, ask for an allowance? I, I got to, she's going to have to pay back some of her tuition. Uh, <laughs> um, but she also gets a signing bonus. I'm not going to go on about how much that is. But why did, why did it happen there? Well, there's education. There was the capital. There was um, a whole bunch of aerospace workers who were laid off in the 70s, uh, not aeros aerospace engineers. So there's, there's a reason certain industries go there. So there's, there's, some, there's a reason for why certain areas diversify and get this great thing. And then once they're going, they're the best place to go there. Hawaii lacks those natural advantages except in tourism right. and military, because we're in the middle of the Pacific, and if America wants to project its power, it's a great place to do it. So we lack the natural advantages. So I'm going to start with there. But then two, we don't and let me just we, we, punctuate here. Labor and capital is what you've mentioned. Yeah. And, Go ahead. And then and we, education. Don't, we have not done what Singapore did, which was exactly what Hawaii is like, but they invested hugely in, in education. And they turned a place that's, you know, that doesn't have low labor costs. It has no land. It, it has very little, but except this. And I'm pointing to my brain for anybody listening on audio. So if we had invested in this, and, and people like Brandy, who I mentored, who just graduated from Shiler, she, she's working at Bank of Hawaii because she's a really smart person. If we invented and had more smart people like that, we could have a diversified economy. But I think that's the key that we lack, is a huge uh, concentration of brain power here. Well, you're echoing something that I hear from a lot of businesses, that A, they can't find the educated workforce they need in order to have a high-tech business, and B, they can't get the capital to go beyond round one of investment. What are, what, what is it, what are we doing to change this? What can be done to change this? Well, that's the hard part. Uh... Hank Rogers has told me he thinks there's plenty of money in Hawaii to be that next level of funding for tech startups, but those people aren't interested in tech startups, right? They want to invest the money in real estate, which is 
a pretty safe bet in Hawaii, you know. So how do you, how do you reach those people and convince them to behave differently, right? What would you appeal to? I don't know. There's a, there's a disconnect in, the, in an opportunity and capital to make it happen, I'm kind of intrigued by. I don't know what the solution is. Uh, you know, there's a lot of small businesses that'll be going on the market because the baby boomer founders are retiring or their family businesses that have run out of generations that are interested in running that business. And that's a great way to become an entrepreneur, right? Is buy something that already exists. You don't have to invent the wheel. You can step in if you've got some executive experience working a day job for other people and you want to be the boss, buy a business. But I think most of the people in Hawaii with the brains and the talent to do that successfully have a Hawaii-sized mortgage. Maybe they have student loans on their kids. Where are they going to get the capital to buy all of these local businesses that are, are going to be available. So there's an opportunity there. I don't know what the solution is, if it's incentives to get uh, banks or lenders to, to make capital available. Uh, I don't know if we, uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, if we make government a lender, not a subsidy, but a lender, so the people get their money back at, at the end of the term. Um, well, if you haven't but, heard in our study of unfunded liabilities that Monday money is not there. No, I know. <laughs> and if government started lending we, it, it would be called a Ponzi scheme. Right, right. But, yes. but you're, you've raised an important point, and it, we could stop here on this point to, and dwell on it just a little bit, but we've got to move on, and that is what really is the role of government? We constantly hear proposals from the legislature for the government to incentivize certain industries so that we can diversify through tax credits or through special programs and so forth. Or we hear that the government can adopt a certain kind of plan to promote development of affordable housing and so forth. But it seems that the sum total of all of these efforts by government is not really generating the kind of economy we need. What do you think about the government's hand in trying to shape the economy? Okay, can I ask your audience a question? How many of you invested in Act 221 companies? You didn't? That was a, that was a tax giveaway. I invested in I have less money than you guys. What was, what's wrong with you guys? You got 100% of your investment back. Why didn't everybody do that? Well, anyways, that was a, you know, there, there's almost, are there any Act 221 companies left? Uh, the one, one of the ones I invested in uh, is still trying to grow, and that's 10 years it started, you know. Um, sorry, another digression. Well, there's a morality tale there to act so, to anyone. What, what can government do? Well, government um, can educate its, its people. I think that that's a, 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 has been a, a function of government, and it's done it well at some, in some places at some times, and not so well in other places at other times. The, the infrastructure is crucial. Those are key functions of, of government. Uh, to provide, I think one of the functions of government is to provide a safety net. You don't want it too high up. You want it uh, for only the people who, who say, have um, serious illnesses. Uh, if the father leaves the family and the, the mother is stuck with three kids. Those sort of things. Those are the primary functions of, of government. There's probably some, some more, but I think those are the main ones. Well, you, you've mentioned, the ones that I like of what you mentioned <laughs> have to do with building a safe infrastructure yeah. within which a market can operate. And so I want to switch to Cam here a bit because I know you're less of a fan of government finding solutions than you are of letting the market itself find those solutions. That's, that's a fair characterization of... It's a My modest viewpoint. characterization. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could get out of the way. That would be the best thing it could do. Uh, so the cost of housing is, is the key thing, right? Uh, why do people leave? They can't afford a good life here. Successful people leave. They feel like they can't afford a good life. And, uh, you know, it's, the cost of housing is directly tied to government policy all the way down to, uh, at the most foundational level, the land use policy that rations land for development, right? So only 5% of Hawaii is available for development. People don't realize it's only 5%. So if you live in urban Honolulu, you think the whole place is ruined already, right? It's just, 
concrete everywhere, but uh, you know, so it's rationed right there at that level, and then it's rationed by, by so many other things, whether it's the, the speed of the, the, the DPP and issuing permits, or it's the nimbyism of neighborhoods full of people who already own their own homes, but they surely don't want anyone else to build in the empty field next to them. There, there are many things that, that we have ourselves to blame for, that uh, government is really only doing what people asked it to do when we say we're overtaxed and overregulated. Yeah. They're not always just sitting there thinking, how can I mess with business today? It only feels that way. But almost everything they do, someone asked them for. Yeah, if you, um, I, I'm going back to permits because that's a huge part of, of the problem with lack of housing is, um, I may be um, stating it incorrectly, but I think there were 11 binders of regulations. Each one of those regulations was passed or approved by somebody and someone with probably good intentions, but all those things add up and it's, uh, 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 Let's sympathize with the, the building permit people. They have to know 11 binders worth of stuff? Heck, I, you, you, that's impossible. So it, the, the burden is not just on us. In some cases, it's ridiculously on the people who are trying to enforce it, who, who are incapable of, of doing that properly. So um, yes, simplification is part of it. Um, yes, we need to have a freer system where government gets out of the way more often and, and affordable housing is the number one reason we have a high huge cost of living and it means it's why so many people are fleeing Hawaii when you do your reports on why you left Hawaii housing is often the number one reason because I can't afford to own a home or I can't even rent well that's a great segue into something that Grassroot Institute has been doing for the last year a project called why people leave Hawaii and maybe many of you have seen some of the stories and the videos and uh, you're absolutely right Steve the number one reason mentioned by people is the cost of housing the number two reason is the inability to find jobs that pay what they need to have have in order to sustain their livelihood and so that raises an important question what, what can we do about the brain drain? Now, I know that between the three of us, we have some interesting perspectives on that. Uh, not only have we become the, one of the states with the highest per capita rate of people leaving because they can't live here economically, we have that happening at all levels, whether they're young or whether they're mid-career or whether they're retiring, because we also are one of the most expensive states to die in as well. and. Uh, Steve, you've got some interesting perspectives on this, that this may not be all that bad. Well, I, 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 we were talking, Cam and I were talking earlier uh, this week, and um, I may be stealing his idea, but it's an idea that I've had too, that you know, one of the reasons why we have, a, um, we, we have this outflow, but we're still Hawaii, and so there's an inflow of people coming in. Um, it's not the way I want it. I would rather my daughter was coming back home after college, but instead someone else is going to take that role in software development here who decides I'm going to put up with all the regulatory nonsense. I'm going to put up with the high cost of housing. I'm going to put up with the uh, negative public school system because I love to surf or I love hiking or some other reason it, or because it's just so much better than Iowa. So. At the same time we have our children and grandchildren leaving, there are these other people coming in, and, and that's um, maybe, you know, I would love it if we kept our kids and we added these smart people, and then, then we'd have a really flourishing economy. But, uh, but yeah, isn't the fact that, that long-term residents leave because they can't afford to get the housing and the uh, they don't have the job opportunities they need. Isn't that fact something that says there's a bit of misalignment in our economy? It's not working the way it's supposed to function? Yeah, when that's the reason, I think that's, that's an alarm bell. Not every reason to leave is a bad one, and we don't have to, to take all of the brain drain personally. If there's, there's certain things you want to do for a living, they're just not going to be here. And there's no way for an economy, the local economy, the size of Hawaii, to provide every industry everyone would conceivably want to work in. So if you want to make movies, you're going to go to LA eventually, right? Uh, there's, there's if you want to be at Facebook, well, 
Yeah. You got to go where Facebook is. Um, and I do like to think that, that the folks who come in Hawaii are, are also nice and smart, just like the ones we're losing. So the brain part ought to be a wash. Uh, but yeah, uh, th this is such a small, isolated town that if Honolulu wasn't in Hawaii, it would just be Boise. You know, and people leave Boise all the time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But it wanted, there's a, the government thing, and the, talking about like uh, abstract uh, feelings that are not measured in, in the surveys, uh, one of the things I heard from a reader who responded to my, my call for input, uh, who didn't want to be named, is now in Austin, Texas, yeah. where he's successfully launched a small tech business that was impossible, he found, to launch here. And one of the things that he finds different between the two towns is a feeling in Austin that you can do things, right? And so one of the most powerful ways in which government sends the signal in Hawaii that you cannot do things isn't even necessarily in the regulations or the permitting or all of that. It's, it's when something like TMT comes along and, and the state won't even enforce its own laws to, to let something new happen. It's when Super Ferry gets shot down. Um, you know, all, all sorts of things like that. There's just, it's, it's easier to say no, and that trickles down. So even if your business is successful, you're, you still feel like you're part of a larger Hawaii narrative of, ugh. You know, and it's, uh, so that's kind of demoralizing. And so my, my reader, who now reads our sister publication in Austin instead of PBN, <laughs> you know, he feels that difference. And it, and it sure doesn't help, too, when, I mean, how many things in Hawaii are now under investigation? Uh, the former police chief, the prosecutor's office, rail, et cetera, et cetera. It just adds to that, ugh, you know? Yeah. It is very discouraging. I mean, the TMT is one of those things that, yeah, um, yes, it was a cumbersome process to finally get it approved, but then even when you get it approved, it's like uh, heads you lose, tails I win, you know? So it doesn't matter what the outcome of the process is. It wasn't that long ago that we were talking about the implications of the loss of the super ferry, not only for the group of businessmen who lost multi-million dollars over that, but for the economy of Hawaii and what it signaled to the world in terms of saying whether we were open for business or not. But imagine, fast forward, what would happen if the TMT failed? What would be the ramifications beyond the local ones in terms of jobs on the island, the big island, and, and education opportunities and so forth? What would be the economic implications for Hawaii's future as well, an investment climate? Two big capital intensive projects being killed, that's terrible, and very publicly. These, these stories are being covered internationally. That's, that's a terrible um, message to anyone who wants to come to Hawaii and build. And it's impossible to measure, really. Right? You can't measure what doesn't happen. There's no way to know how many people were in Los Angeles or London or Frankfurt thinking, well, maybe Hawaii someday. And then they saw the news and thought, oh, no, maybe not. It looks kind of crazy down there. And it, it tends to get a self-fulfilling uh, condition. So you remember the people on Kauai who uh, opposed the super ferry. And, and no one did a statistical study, but there was a lot of people who had just moved there. And it was sort of a NIMBY thing. Uh, I got my place on Kauai. I don't want this job uh, creating super ferry coming to my island because I want it to remain backward. That's why I came here. So you have all these people coming to Hawaii for a reason that may be about keeping it the way it is now. And the people who want to be entrepreneurs are actually leaving. So you have this imbalance of who's here and who isn't here. Do you, am I making a... I, I, yeah, I see where you're coming from. Uh, and, and it's self-selective. Yeah, and, a, and an example of damage we do to ourselves is the bumper sticker, slow down, this ain't the mainland. You know, I mean, all right, that's funny, that's cute. 
What does that really mean? I don't know. Don't work so hard? Don't succeed so much? What, what do you mean, slow down? This ain't the mainland. So people, people are, are a little bit frightened of success, maybe, because it sounds like it, it's really hard work, which it is. But people are already working really hard, so why not just try to be successful? You know, let's move from the macro to the micro level. Uh, let's say someone from the mainland calls you up and says, I want to move my business to Hawaii, or I want to get started. I want to bring a new industry here. What's the advice you'll give to that business? Stay away? Or? I would ask a lot of questions before I gave advice. Who are you? How prepared are you? What, do you, what, do you, what line are you in? Uh, am I liable if I answer your question? <laughs> There's that. Should I have an attorney present before we <laughs> continue speaking? Uh, it's too bad we just can't have open arms and say, great, the climate is wonderful for business. Come on over. Yeah. You know, where, where we, we do experience it, and, and from our readers we hear a lot about, is recruitment in general. So if you just think of employees you're trying to bring down as independent entrepreneurs, bosses of their own enterprises, uh, they, would, they have some of the same concerns any business thinking about moving here would be, which is all the stuff we've talked about, right? I've joked with my boss, Tammy, anyone smart enough to be a, a business reporter at PBN is smart enough to know they should not move to Hawaii <laughs> to be a business reporter for PBN. Um, so when, when I do recruitment, I'm just really blunt about like, look, here's the challenges I've seen people have in adjusting. And it's even like intangible things like communication style. So, you know, if you're especially East Coast people, uh, I, I think they have a, a hard adjustment because they just say things that pop into their heads whenever they think them. And we don't do that. We think that's rude. And we're wondering why you're doing it. So, I, you know, I do counseling like that. Do you find yourself doing the same thing? I, I, I try and be as blunt as possible. I'm known for being blunt. And so I think, it, tell them the truth. If someone called me, first thing I tell them, I'm not an expert. You know, I, here's what I... I think, and I would be very blunt about the challenges that they, they want to come here because of they were here on vacation and it was wonderful and they felt really good about it. Let me give you the reality as best I can, and and um, you know take do your research because the reality is really tough. It's hard on running a business here. Your journals covered the fact that recently the Hawaii Executive Conference convened and brought together some of the leading executives here in the state of Hawaii. And one of the subjects they looked at was the cost of government and how that rising cost impacts the business community. One of the studies released by the Hawaii Executive Conference uh, was one uh, our Joe Kent himself worked on and we were able to consult on a little bit, but we want to give the credit to uh, Colbert Matsumoto and uh, a bunch of others who led that project. Originally, uh, going into the project, people were aware that our state government had at least $26 billion of unfunded liabilities, about $13 billion that we low owe in our pension system, about $13 billion we owe in our health care system for public employees. But what this study showed is that when you add up what we also owe in terms of long-term liabilities for infrastructure that have to be paid, or for civil defense, or for natural disasters, that figure is now $88 billion and rising. That's what we have to pay over the next 30 years just to keep our government solvent. Now, what is the impact of such a, a tenuous situation for government finance upon the business climate, upon the business world here in Hawaii? I can think of one being that the government sometimes will move into behaviors that are short-term in terms of grabbing more money, raising taxes. That would be an impact. What are your thoughts, gentlemen? It's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, we have a reporter working on a story trying to figure that out because um, Colbert, as brave as he was in Kampai and Joe, Compiling that report, 
um, does not tell us how to deal with it. What is the answer? Where to cut? Where to, to, to raise the money? All those, those questions remain unanswered. And that's why the January edition of Hawaii Business is going to feature grassroots institutes. Yeah. Ten point plan. Uh, Noel interviewed <laughs> you this week, right? Yesterday, that's right. Okay, okay. so uh, stay tuned for that issue. Um, <clears throat> uh, my wife works for the University of Hawaii, so her pension, <laughs> I, I have a conflict of interest right now. Um, but, you know, um, we can't afford government workers to get pensions anymore. Nobody has pensions. Who has pensions? Um, I don't get a pension. Um, so. I, I, it's just not the, the economy of business, nothing is structured. It used to be a great thing in the 50s and 60s to have a pension, you could re retire on it. People are living so much longer, we can't afford to give government workers a pension. I think that's a start. Well, our, our pension structure is a function of a historic e event here in Hawaii, which is the rise of public sector unions. And uh, in some ways they've evolved very positively, in other ways they haven't evolved so much. Let me generalize a question from that. Do you think that the political climate where we have only one party, and it wouldn't matter which party that was, whether it was the big R or the big D or the little L, uh, do you think a political climate in which there's just one party has an impact upon the business climate? I think you always want to have competition, and you want to have competition in the political structure. Um, here's, um, okay, I'm going to go a little bit off topic, but if you want the Republican Party to be strong again, you can't answer, a, uh, talk about liabilities, and you use the word natural disasters, and you do not use the word climate change. Part of that $88 billion is climate change. Uh, I know probably because of the makeup of this room, some of you don't believe in climate change. I'm sorry, it's happening right now, we're living it. The last five years have been the hottest five years in recorded history. The 80s were the hottest decade ever, except they were beaten by the 90s, which were even hotter, which were beaten by the 2000s, which were hotter, and this decade's gonna be beat them all. Climate change is real. It is man-made. Let me finish. Sorry, I'm going to go on for a little while. It is man-made. Um, they were predicting that we would influence the climate in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century. By the 1980s, climate change science was absolute fact. And we've in ignored that for years and years. Um, it's not natural climate change. It's, it's what, an incredible coincidence. We predicted climate change and it's happening now just the way it was predicted? No, it's not natural. So first thing is first, we've got to deal with climate change because we can talk about the business climate in Hawaii right now, but in 30 or 40 years, the business climate in Hawaii is going to be a mess because we're not dealing with the climate climate right now. Steve, point well taken, and for a counterpoint, I'm going to go to the guy who's wearing a coat right now because he's so cold. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cam? Well, I don't really, I, I, a, a counterpoint to what, what Steve has said is kind of irrelevant. The public policy question is before us. So given that, now where do we spend the money, right? I mean, Bjorn Lomborg wrote a book, The Skeptical Environmentalist, that didn't debate for a moment the reality of climate change, but did debate the public policy response to it and said, for example, that collectively as a species, not Hawaii specifically, for far less money and trouble, we could guarantee every human being on Earth fresh, clean drinking water resulting in greater happiness more prosperity than spending the money recommended on the solutions to specifically mitigate climate change. So I think those sorts of discussions include valid options. Um, we're, we're the tiniest little rock on the world. Our ability to influence China, for example, which just opened 17 more coal mines this year, uh, it seems fairly limited. Uh, so yeah, we, we have to make policy decisions about how to adapt. Uh, 
but I'm, I'm open to suggestion on, on what that means or what that looks like. I mean, if, if we're staving off the end of the world, then we should stop all flights to Hawaii immediately, right? I mean, isn't that air travel produces an incredible amount of carbon dioxide for something that's essentially a luxury good, right? It's a luxury to take a vacation in Hawaii. So we're contributing to climate change with our number one industry. Are we prepared to shut that down? Are we prepared to do so in the next 30 years? Well, I'm getting... And what does that, you know, what's the policy response right. to that? And Do we just immediately require everyone comes here by sailboat? So, and, well, Steve, <laughs> I, I'm going to step in at this point because this topic is so fascinating. It deserves an entire program in and of itself. We'll see so, you next week. We'll, yes, so we'll, we'll be back. What we'll do is we'll suffice it to say whether there is climate change to the extent that one of you believes or there is not, the fact is we do live in a state where that's a political entity, where people are operating on that premise. Mm -hmm. And there's a ramification in terms of the cost of energy for business and the options that business has in terms of energy. Now, with that said, I want to bring our audience into the conversation so they can interact with you. If you have a question for either of our guests, Steve or Cam, would you kindly come up to the microphone? We'll bring it up here a little closer to me. We want to hear from you. And uh, again, because we want to get in as many questions and answers as possible, if you'd simply come to the microphone, say your name, Dick, and ask your question briefly, that would be really great. So Dick, come on up. Thanks for, thanks for being the first. Go ahead and introduce yourself. The first question is the toughest. I, I, I think in listening, you've missed the issue. I think the um, biggest problem we have in Hawaii is the lack of leadership. And if we had the right kind of leadership, not the micro leadership of the banking industry or, or something else, but true enlightened leadership, that we would be able to find our way out of these issues. And I'd be interested in your reaction. Thanks for your observation, Dick. Anyone else? Come on up. These gentlemen are available to you, and I'd love to hear from you. Go, go ahead and introduce I, yourself. Oh, I have a thought on that, though, if that's right. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's sort of like the wrong people were in charge. That's why it failed. Uh, I think it's the systems that we have uh, that, that keep great ideas from happening. Just my gut reaction. But I agree. I mean, yes, in, in, in certain ways, it would be good to see more inspiring leadership in, in specific situations like TMT, for example. But in the broad general scheme of thing, I, I think that we have structural problems. Thank you. Hi, thanks for doing this, by the way. Um, I think you both hit on the, a conundrum of Leaders are responding to what people ask for, and people are asking for essentially in a business climate that isn't friendly. Given that self-fulfilling prophecy, the term that you use, what hope do we have and how do we get out of it? So um, I've been thinking, I, I, I'm, what Kaylee uh, had said before about one party government, I think um, what might be successful in driving a little bit of change would be a less all or nothing attitude by Republicans. Um, shoot for, don't, we're not gonna get the moon in Hawaii. Shoot for something incremental. So um, your, your discussion with uh, Representative Ed Case, who is a centrist Democrat, I think, by Hawaii standards, and he uh, talked about changes to the Jones Act. He, you're not going to get rid of the Jones Act, but maybe changing one part of it. That's an incremental change. Maybe uh, for um, supporting people like Case and others. There, there are other centrist Democrats at the legislature. There are a lot of ex-Republicans in, uh, in, in Hawaii politics that still believe what a lot of what you believe in. They just couldn't 
stay within the Republican Party. Maybe those are the people that can drive a little bit of incremental change in Hawaii. That's a little bit of political advice from someone who doesn't cover politics anymore. You know, what I hear you saying, Steve, is that in order to generate more competition on the political level, the, the, the smaller competitors, the voices that aren't heard, yeah. sh should put forth proposals that can, can be accepted by the other side. I, you, you are a man who likes to seek common ground. That's, that's a way to seek common ground. I think uh, there are a lot of people in Hawaii who want to see a more vibrant economy. Um, they may not want everything that you want, but try and find some common ground with them. Um, I, 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 I'm not a political advisor, but I think that maybe is a smart strategy for driving change. Thanks. Next question. Hi, Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Nagamini, and I wanted to ask um, both of you, but in particular Cam, what your feeling is on the, the vacation rental, the bill that the city council recently passed. I think University of Hawaii or somebody did a study that we're going to lose $30 million a month um, in tourist dollars because of this, this issue. A lot of vacation rentals are shutting down. How is that going to affect other businesses, retail, restaurants, um, everything that goes on here. What, how do you but that is such that? a complicated one because there's so many, there's so many things involved. It's also, I think, uh, related to the arrival of rideshare technology, where you saw an industry response from the incumbent industry of taxi cabs, right? Here's an example of where our overregulated business community runs to government for more regulation as soon as they have a competitor. Uh, and, and then you, you could even get into philosophical arguments like what is the meaning of private property? If you can't use your car the way you want to, if you can't use your house the way you want to, um, I, I think there's different externalities between your car and your home. I think that neighbors have some input into what kind of neighborhood they want to live in. I don't know, so there are these complicated things. Economically, you know, and you could say, well, the, the hotel industry, which was very interested in, well, what they, what they explained to us was they, they didn't mind the competition because they're full, right? We have record visitation. They're not hurting for business. The hotels are quite comfortable. But what they didn't like was uh, that the vacation rentals weren't held to the same safety standards that they have to meet. They would, didn't have to get fire inspections. All that overregulated stuff, right? The, these, these illegal rentals were skating through all of that. And so they felt there was an unfairness in the market. Um, yeah, definitely. When, when tourists are pulled back out of neighborhoods where they were spending locally in stores and shops and activities, those neighborhoods are going to take a hit. Do you think those people that were coming and spending, say, $125 a night for a vacation rental yeah. or a bed and breakfast in a private home are now going to come and spend $300 a night to stay in Waikiki at a hotel? Well, maybe, but I don't know that it's the money that matters so much. There, there's some extremely expensive uh, temporary visitor accommodations, luxury homes, thousands of dollars right. a night. But those are for uh, people. You know, I mean. it, it re, it, what it shows is a changing marketplace, a changing kind of tourism where people really want to feel like they visited the real place that they flew to. They don't want to stay in tourist areas. They want to stay in a home. They want to stay in a neighborhood. And they want to have the fantasy that they really live there, you know, even if it's just for a week or two. Uh, and, and so that's a, that's a new market demand. And if that's what a visitor wants, a hotel is never going to be, at any price, the, the solution for them. Thanks, Ken. Do you have any? We'll take a next Steve. question then. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, my name is Mark Moniscalco. And uh, I have a question for uh, both you, Steve and Cam. How difficult is it to get young people to uh, cons thank you. consider a uh, career as a business reporter. Uh, I would assume most of the young journalist majors consider business the evil empire. So what, what's your experience been reporting the young folks? I can take that one first. Um, well, we work for what's known as traditional media. Uh, and it's, um, it's a tough business to be in um, because people are reading print less. And so we, 
we, we get most of our money from print advertising. We're trying to transition to digital, but people are used to getting things free on the web. So we don't pay a whole lot of money. Um, it's not a surprise to anyone. I think they have to be passionate about the things we cover. And um, we have a great working environment. Uh, I'm told I'm a pretty nice boss. That's my main selling points. No one's going to get rich covering any form of journalism, including business journalism. So uh, I like the advice I give to the business person coming from the outside to Hawaii. I give some pretty blunt stuff. Uh, this is what you're going to make uh, about, you know, if, if you like what we're doing, please join us. But I'm not going to be able to make you rich. Cam? I always have a lot of candidates when I do have an opening. So I haven't been too concerned. Uh, you know, what I then have to be careful about is, is if they're from outside explaining Hawaii. If the cover letter says, I've always dreamed of being a writer in Hawaii, I'm not here to make your dreams come true. I'm sorry. Your, your opening line should have been, I've always dreamed of working for Pacific Business News. That's <laughs> where you should have come at me from. <laughs> uh, and you know, the, I, I find that they're, they're smart young people. They're inquisitive. They're interested in how things work and understanding it. And they're interested in telling stories. Uh, I had a related thought that I lost, but uh, the you know the most of my interest does come from the mainland though the journalism programs here are are fairly small they they've shrunk as the industry has shrunk and oh, oh i remember my thought the the young folks i've hired uh don't seem to be carrying the same existential dread about the future of journalism that 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 maybe me as a Gen Xer, you, you, you're we're about the same age. You know, we're, if if you lived through the contraction of the industry through the internet era, you're really anxious. Uh, and I'm not seeing that anxiety in the younger ones. I think they're coming into the industry at its new size and its new reality. And for them, they don't know there was a time when thousands of newspapers lived on a 30 to 40 percent profit margin of classified advertising that was destroyed by Craigslist. So they don't know what they're missing. I don't tell them stories about the old days. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Anyone else before we close tonight? Yes, we'll take one more. Christy. We are living in a wonderful age of high technology. Doesn't everyone here love it? This enables a lot of workers all over the world to work anywhere. So if you're working for Facebook or Google, or Cisco or anyone, why can't these companies have some satellite offices here in Hawaii so your daughter working for Facebook can do her work right here? And for people who have never been to Hawaii before, they can move to this wonderful, gorgeous place, go surfing on the North Shore, travel to the neighbor islands on the weekend, and still do their coding and everything right here from their condo in Kaka'ako. So what can we do to attract these large, extremely successful businesses to Hawaii? We want to diversify our economy. It's been talked about for decades, my entire life living here. So what can we do to make this happen? Good closing question. You want to take a stab at it? What can we do? What can we do? Well, um, <laughs> I, maybe I'm a little cynical. I think companies offer this whole flex time, work from home kind of thing as like a selling point when they're recruiting. But when you get right down to it, everyone wants FaceTime. And I don't mean the app. They want to see you in the office doing some work. So I, I think there's less opportunity for telecommu telecommuting than businesses like to say that there is, if that makes sense. That's just a gut reaction to the question. I don't know. I haven't given it real thought. I, Maybe I, you've given it real thought, well, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm shocked by some of the things that are possible distance. I, I'm, I, I volunteer on uh, a Maui with the uh, Friends of Haleakala, and the guy running the expedition in to pull invasive species in the crater worked for IBM. And he worked in chip development, of all things. And he was living on Maui. and. You know, how do you work on something that's, that's actually, you know, it seems like you need a lab. So 
there's possibilities. How to make it happen, I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't got that figured out. We, we, we have the attraction, he loved living on Maui. So um, is these possibilities grow? Yes, I hope my daughter can work remotely from her bedroom, so she's just uh, you know one flight of stairs away from me. Um, I, I don't know how to attract the companies here to do that, though. Um, I, I, technically, it's possible, you're right. You want FaceTime, you want to be able to make sure someone's doing your job, but there's all kinds of things now that measure productivity, and they're getting increasing more and more. I don't have time to supervise my people. They, they're, they're essentially working remotely almost uh, now because I, I see them maybe once a day. I see they're sitting at the desk. I know they're doing their job because they're getting their job done, and they're doing a damn fine job of it. But I'm not looking over their shoulders, so um, it, it is possible, and I think it's going to get more and more possible. Well, we're working on it, too, at the Grassroot Institute, where a growing component of our workforce is actually virtual all over the world. For example, the editing of the video for what we're doing today, the uh, residual articles that will come out featuring what you have to say is going to be worked on by a virtual team. And we benefit from some of the changes in technology. For example, we've recently taken on two former employees of the Star Advertiser, uh, which has downsized because of te digital competition. And uh, I guess they must be desperate enough to work for us. <laughs> but we're in a changing economy, and I just want to invite all of you to continue that dialogue with us as to what's going to make this economy and business climate work. But before we do that, get ready to meet Steve Petranik and Cam Napier personally now over some refreshment. Give them a big hand. They did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you.